There was not a shortage of smiles as Shavi police officers spent some time with some of the smaller citizens they serve. Today's society, that I think there's some miscommunication on what the purpose is of police officers and, and who we are and, uh, and exactly like how much we care about the public and, uh, and the community. The effort is twofold, to build trust between officers and citizens and allow them time to show they're just human. You know, the best thing I can always tell people is that we're trying to protect and serve. That's the oath that we took. We're trying to make sure everybody goes home safely, including ourselves. Shavi Police Cares for Kids will visit 1,600 students over the next three days at schools like Cane Run Elementary, a place for the students to feel safe and ask questions to break down barriers. To go into the classrooms and for them to see that they are here to protect and to serve them, that they are here handing out gifts to them and talking to them about safety. Handing out bags with coloring books, sticker badges, and activities to go along with the lessons, Principal Kimberly Koslow welcomes this type of interaction. To be able to see the officers actually in their rows and seeing them out with the community and for them to know that it is safe, that when they need help, that they can count on the police officers. Shively officers add that it's an opportunity to connect and is aimed at changing perspectives. It's a profession they work to improve each day. I always tell our people we're a practicing profession. They have to continually keep up on, on everything. Colin Mayfield, WLKY News. Shively FOP Lodge 17 partner with Shively Councilman Delbert Vance and other members to secure funding for that program. A zombie nativia scene causing controversy again. This year it was vandalized just a day after it went up. The homeowner talks about it next on WLKY News. Tonight on WLKY, Survivor at 8 o'clock, followed by Criminal Minds and Code Black with Rob Lowe at 10. Then stay with us for WLKY News at 11. A southern Indiana man was arrested in Ohio after police say he was found in a child's bedroom with his pants down. David Richardson is facing multiple charges, including sexual battery, burglary, and unlawful sexual conduct with a minor. According to an arrest report, a woman called police to say she found a stranger in her foster child's bedroom. Police identify that man as Richardson, the 43-year-old, is from Charlestown. A man accused of killing a Lexington teenager is now behind bars at the Fayette County Detention Center. Kevin Garcia was extradited from West Virginia. He's charged with murder and the death of 14-year-old Angel Juarez. Lexington police say Garcia shot Juarez on Thanksgiving night. Police say the shooting was the result of a feud between Garcia and Juarez's older brother. Authorities say Garcia was trying to confront the brother. Instead, the victim answered the door and was shot moments later. The family of a northern Kentucky teen killed by a sheriff's deputy reached a settlement with the department. Boone County Deputy Tyler Brockman shot and killed Samantha Ramsey in her car in April of 2014. Investigators said the 19-year-old had marijuana and alcohol in her system as she tried to drive away from a field party. The deputy said he fired when he was nearly pinned between cars. A civil lawsuit settlement of $3.5 million covers all damage claims, attorney fees, and expenses. As part of the settlement, the department agreed to review and implement new policies. Brockman was never charged in the shooting. An early morning fire at a three-story residential hotel in Indianapolis left several people injured. Six people were taken to hospitals for treatment, including one listing in critical condition. Seven others were treated at the scene. Officials say about 45 of the hotel's roughly 60 rooms were occupied. Firefighters safely rescued 10 people from windows and balconies. The fire department says the fire apparently started in the basement. The Indiana State Fire Marshal was back at the scene of a deadly house fire today. An 18-year-old, her four-month-old daughter, and four-year-old brother were killed in the fire. It happened in the city of Brazil, which is about 65 miles west of Indianapolis. Another four-year-old was taken to the hospital but is expected to be okay. It's tragic for this family, and, you know, my, you know, the guys are... The fire department taking it pretty hard because they, you know, did the best they could and it was still uh, not the outcome you want. Investigators say gas to the home was shut off and family members were using portable heaters throughout the house. The cause of the fire has not been determined. The Red Cross is helping surviving family members. A judge decided against delaying the trial of a man accused of setting a fire which killed two Ohio firefighters. Ray Abu Arab is charged with aggravated murder. Police say he started the fire in Toledo in 2014 which killed a veteran firefighter and a rookie who got trapped inside. He's being held on a bond of nearly $6 million scheduled for a pretrial in February in the potential death penalty case. A 
The judge declined a defense request to postpone the trial date, but will consider arguments to modify its bond next week. Vandals damage a controversial nativity scene in suburban Cincinnati. For the last three years, Jason Dixon was displayed this zombie nativity scene in his front yard. Tuesday morning, Dixon found it ripped apart in pieces and scattered across his yard. If the zombie nativity scene is all you have to worry about in life, then you got some issues. They can break it all the way down. It doesn't matter. I'll put it right back up. Dixon is no stranger to controversy. Just last year, Sycamore Township slapped him with 27 misdemeanor charges and more than $13,000 in fines. The charges were eventually dropped. The zombie nativity scene is now guarded with security cameras. The power of positive thinking could be good for your health. And it's the holiday season, and even the royal family has gotten into the Christmas spirit. Find out what all this is about next on WLKY News. All right, how about a look now at the numbers from Wall Street? Everything's up today substantially, the Dow Jones is anyway, 298 points, NASDAQ up 61, S&P up 29. All right, question for you. Mm -hmm. Are you and you a glass half empty person or a half full kind of person? Depends on what's in the glass. Oh, okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. I get that. New research suggests a positive outlook on life could have big health benefits. Dr. Malika Marshall has a story. Hayami Koga says she tries to stay positive. I think I'm more of a glass half full person. I try to look at the bright side of life. A new study shows an optimistic outlook on life may help you live longer. We found that um, when comparing the most optimistic to the least optimistic women, uh, people had a reduced risk of dying from cancer, infection, stroke, heart disease, and uh, lung disease as well. Dr. Eric Kim and researchers from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health yeah. looked at data on 70,000 women over eight years. The most optimistic women had a nearly 30 percent lower risk of dying. It seems to have the most effect on cardiovascular outcomes and the smallest effect on cancer outcomes. Researchers say that taking steps to boost your optimism might also lead to healthy behaviors and better coping skills. Dr. Kim says there are some easy ways to do that. One's called best possible self. So you think about your different domains of life, whether it's your personal relationship, like your spouse, your career, and your friendships. In each of those domains, you think about the best possible outcome. To increase optimism, you can also write down three things you're grateful for each night and make a list of the kind things you've done for others. Dr. Malika Marshall, CBS News, Boston. While this study only looked at women, researchers say the findings would also apply to men. The royal family is getting into the Christmas spirit for a good cause. We wanted to do something that was really playful but also respectful to the figures because of course it's the royal family. For the first time ever, Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in London dressed the royals for the festive holiday season and Britain's sweaters are called jumpers and sometimes worn at Christmas time to raise awareness for a good cause. When the palace heard it was a fundraiser for the Save the Children charity, it gave the royal nod. And we actually wrote to them and asked them specifically if we could um, put their wax models in Christmas jumpers and they were really happy to support us. The Queen almost smiling there? I think so. It looks like it. The museum is encouraging people to take selfies with the royals to promote Save the Children's annual Christmas jumper day. Good sports there. Rick's here now with a look at what we're working on for 6 o'clock. Well, Vicki, the technology helping first responders know schools and businesses inside and out before they're called in an emergency. Plus, Kentucky's efforts to end the rape kit backlog. I'm Mark Vandroff. Coming up, we'll bring you the latest from Frankfurt. Honoring a local Pearl Harbor survivor, the ceremony to thank a Marine for his sacrifice two years after his death. Vicki, Eric. Thank you, Rick. Hey, UofL and UK are both in action tonight. The Cats are coming off their first loss of the season to UCLA. Dan Koop has more from Lexington. Just a few days after their 42-game home winning streak was snapped by UCLA, the Cats are back at it, hosting the Valpo Crusaders, an experienced-laden bunch that will not have stars in their eyes once the lights come up at Rupp. We live with that every game, too. Every one, not only do they give their best shot, but the second part of it is they play loose. They got nothing to lose. No one wins in Rupp Arena. Got nothing to lose. Just shoot balls, fadeaways, hooks. Do it. If they don't go, you weren't supposed to win anyway. And if they go, oh my gosh, you can, we'll keep the tape for your grandchildren. That's what we go against, especially in Rupp. And we still don't want 
Cal says he hasn't been happy with the ball movement offensively of late, even though the Cats rank fourth nationally with 20.6 assists per game. You know, we're, we're still learning about our team. What I told them is uh, I didn't think I had to do this, but if they're not passing the ball like they normally do, then we got to go to some offenses that force them to make three or four passes before they can even think about shooting. Valpo and Kentucky have identical 7-1 and one records this season. They're a terrific team, team. And now we got a bunch of young kids. Let's see if we got better and let's see how we do in a game like this. If Valpo's going to have any chance in this game, they need Alec Peters to really show out. The Valpo senior averages 25 points and 9 rebounds a game and is certainly attracting plenty of NBA attention the entire season. At Rupp Arena, Dan Koob, WLKY Sports. Yavel is also back home tonight. Yeah, but right now Fred is going to tell us about this year's Paul Horning Award winner. Hey, Fred. Eric, Vicky, hello again, everybody. Welcome to the KFCM Center, where UofL hosts Southern Illinois at 7 o'clock. More on that coming up in 30 minutes. Meantime, the 2016 Paul Horning Award was announced today, and the winner is Jabril Peppers. Now, Peppers is the seventh player to win the Horning Award as the most versatile player in major college football. The third-year sophomore just became the first earned Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, Linebacker of the Year, and Return Specialist of the Year. Peppers defines what the Horning Award is all about. Played 15 different positions for the Wolverines on three sides of the ball on a team ranked sixth in the country. Peppers and Michigan play Florida State in the Orange Bowl December the 30th. Peppers will be in Louisville to receive the award from Horning March the 7th. I don't think there's anything this kid can't do. He's proved it on a, playing in a tough league. You know, the Big Ten's a tough situation. You win an award in the Big Ten, you're as good as it. You're as good. You're on a level that's not really matched, you know, as far as winning awards. If you can win something out of the Big Ten as Player of the Year or something like that, that uh, it's something to be proud of. And we're proud that we got a, got him as a winner here. He'll be here for the dinner, of course. Paul, the 1956 Heisman winner, says Lamar Jackson from U of L should win the Heisman Trophy on Saturday. This is part of U of L's campaign, Lit. Hashtag L1C4. There are only 15 of these that exist. One of them came to our TV station today. And as part of the deal, they're calling for it to light up. Let's see if I can do this without falling over. One, two, light it up for Lamar Jackson from the KFC Yum Center. I am Fred Calgill, WLKY Sports. All right, weather-wise, we've got some pretty big changes on the way. I know it was chilly out there today, but get ready. Things are going to turn pretty cold as we move into tomorrow and also for the rest of the work week. We'll talk more about that and any and all chances for some snow around the Ohio Valley. That is coming up next. Now, your WLKY weather with Chief Meteorologist Jay Cardosi. Here we are, the seventh day of December, and we still have yet to see any snowflake activity, at least around the metro. Typically, our first flurries fly on November 15th, and the first measurable snowfall is happening today on average. Well, again, that certainly hasn't happened. And as we look forward in time, uh, a flurry will become possible around the region as that colder air really starts to work in, mainly tomorrow night, maybe into Friday morning. A couple of snowflakes may actually form Sunday during the day before it quickly changes over to some rain. Otherwise, there will be a chance for some light snow the way things are looking right now in the middle of next week as yet another wave of cold air, even colder air, comes in from the north and also the northwest. But as far as those big tallies of snow, we don't see anything right now on the horizon, but we'll certainly keep you posted. Hey, outside right now, is that a beautiful, beautiful picture or what? This from the Bristol restaurant, looking back towards, of course, beautiful downtown Louisville. We have partly cloudy skies overhead. Temperatures are chilly. We topped out in the low to middle 40s. Right now, the range is 40 to 43 humidity 37 percent and we have a northwesterly breeze in here at about six miles per hour so you can see what's coming in we have the 40s here 30s just off to the northwest farther north and northwest we're in the 20s and as those winds kick up just a little bit later on tonight that's the air that's going to be ushering in our direction on top of that a few clouds will also be moving in we do have some snowflake activity well off to the west I think that's going to dry up before reaching us. The air around here is extremely dry, uh, but there's the front. It'll pass through here a little bit later on tonight. With it, 
will come that band of clouds. Otherwise, the breezes will kick in and the temperatures will start to nose down. That is for sure. As we look at those numbers, we're going to wake up to the middle and upper 20s, close to 30, with chills in the 20s. And through the day tomorrow, even with a lot of sun, not much warming, a high of 35, but the feel like temperatures will stay in the 20s. Here's your forecast. Next few hours, a chilly one for sure. The 40s will settle back into the 30s with increasing clouds. 35 at 10 o'clock tonight. We'll wake up to 30 in the city with 20s in outlying regions in the morning. Just 33 for your lunch hour, even with lots of sunshine, chill factors in the 20s. The high tomorrow, 35. We're 32 on Friday. There could be a morning flurry. Otherwise, through the weekend, especially Sunday, rain expected late day. It might start off with a few wet snowflakes. Next week, the next wave of uh, cold air, I should say, builds in for Wednesday. And it looks like that's going to be even colder than the one tomorrow. And then there'll be a wave of cold air after that. It's wintertime <laughs> after all, right? Man. Looking forward to March, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> When I say a wave of warm air yeah. on the way. We'll wait for it. It'll be a while. Hey, thank you, Jay. Okay. Next at 6, the future of UofL basketball at the Yum Center. Why athletic director Tom Jurich is questioning whether the city wants them in the arena. And what city officials say they want the university to do to step up and do in the face of mounting debt. This is WLKY Louisville, live, local, late breaking. Your complete news coverage for Greater Louisville starts right now. Good evening, I'm Rick Van Hoos. I'm Vicki Dorch. Thousands of fans are making their way to the KFC Yum Center right now for tonight's U of L men's basketball game. The cards are taking the court just days after athletic director Tom Jurich vented frustration over the arena's financial woes, questioning whether the city really wants U of L playing downtown. WLKY's Emily Maha tells us what both sides say about the situation. Emily? Rick, Vitti, Rick, Vicky, when the city approved the money to pay for the Yum Center about a decade ago, they thought the arena was going to make a lot more money. Now debts are getting too expensive, and they're asking the University of Louisville to fork over more cash. But U of L Athletics Director Tom Jurich says he won't be the only one carrying the burden. The University of Louisville's done their part. And that's the thing that really disappoints me so much is they've changed the whole the whole conversation to blame it on the University of Louisville, and I think that's criminal. That was Tom Jurich on the D&D Spill the Tea radio show on WLOU over the weekend. The, the way we look at it, we'll be a team player. We've said we'll help in any problems that they have there, but I don't want to be the only one that helps. The University of Louisville athletic director says he never wanted an arena downtown. He's always wanted it on campus. But everybody said, please come down and be a team player. So I was a team player. Went down. The University, City of Louisville and Commonwealth all went in on a deal to build the KFC Yum Center. But now debt payments are about to increase and the city wants the university to pay more to play at the Yum Center. We want to be partners with the university and um, I think that they want to be partners with the city. And I believe the state's also has huge, huge um, buy-in on this and I think that they, they will all step up and work together. But Jurich feels like the city wants U of L out of the Yum Center altogether. Over on our campus, we're very tired of it. We're tired of all the rhetoric. If they don't want us, then they just tell us. Metro Council President David Yates says that's not the case. He says the Metro Council will vote later this week on a resolution that will allow the mayor to negotiate a better deal with the university and the Commonwealth. We're a tripod. If any one of us does not step up and do what we need to do, um, if we're not willing to put the community above our own interest, if we're not willing to play together, play ball together, um, then we won't get a better deal. The Metro Council Budget Committee is set to meet tomorrow. The council president tells me he expects that resolution to be approved. Reporting live downtown, Emily Maha, WLKY News. Thanks, Emily. Now, the KFC Yum Center is the third largest college basketball arena behind only the Carrier Dome in Syracuse and Rupp Arena. Since it opened in 2010, nearly two and a half million fans have attended men's basketball games. The university expects to surpass that benchmark at tonight's game. The first DNA test results are back from thousands of rape kits in Kentucky. Those results led Louisville police to reopen four cases. WLKY's Mark Vanderhoff has been investigating the rape kit backlog for nearly three years. Mark, I'm surprised just four cases. More cases to be reopened across the state? Definitely expect a lot more cases and today the Attorney General's office announced more resources to help law enforcement agencies investigate these cases as test results continue to arrive. 
the first set of kits are coming back to Jefferson uh, and then Fayette County. We've already held a training uh, in Jefferson County to go over the best procedures. More than one year ago, a state audit found more than 3,000 DNA samples from alleged sexual assaults were never tested. Those rape kits are finally being tested, and as a result, four cold cases have been reopened in Louisville alone. Now, the Attorney General's office is preparing law enforcement agencies with an online toolkit and training seminars. 10, 12 years ago, when this technology came about, officers, uh, they, they didn't get the training that, that would catch them up to the technology. So far, 1,517 rape kits have been sent to a private lab. 913 have been analyzed. A group of police officers, prosecutors, and others created the training materials to help those local agencies with what comes next. This collaboration has enabled everyone to share information and ideas. It's helped us to recognize the unique challenges in prosecuting not only cold cases, but sexual assault cases in general. The DNA samples are cross-referenced with a national DNA database, which can help identify a possible suspect. Now, as those kits are coming back, uh, understand that investigations can and will or have uh, been open, but those are investigations that folks aren't going to comment on until uh, there has been an arrest or other action. Now, there's no timeline for when all the rape kits will be tested and returned to police departments after private lab tests. The kits have to be sent to the Kentucky State Police, who then review them. And so far, state police have only gotten through about 70 of those kits. Makes you scratch your head. So why weren't these kits tested in the first place, Mark? Well, there's a variety of reasons, and here's one that I've heard most often. The state crime lab does DNA testing for all kinds of crimes, and they've got their hands full. So a lot of detectives at the local level They've only sent in the cases that they know could be prosecuted. Now, that attitude is changing, though, because of changes in state guide guidelines, and the state is trying to do more to get more resources to that state crime lab. All right. Thank you, Mark. New tonight, a Louisville man is arrested as part of a child porn investigation. 59-year-old Samuel Daughtry was arraigned today on three counts of distributing child porn. Police say he shared numerous images online from his computer. The judge lowered Daughtry's bond to $1,500. If released, he was ordered not to use the Internet. New tonight at 6, a Louisville man is arrested for injuring his brother in a drive-by shooting. Courtney Pierce was arraigned today for attempted murder, assault, and other charges. According to arrest records, the 27-year-old fired at his brother as he drove past the man's home last month. The victim was hit in the face. Pierce turned himself in overnight. He's being held on a $50,000 bond. Also new at 6, an illegal immigrant wanted for a deadly hit-and-run in Louisville is now facing federal charges. A federal grand jury indicted Miguel Villansenor for being in the United States illegally. A warrant is out for his arrest for an October crash on the outer loop near Great Lane. Police say the 40-year-old hit two women who were checking their car for damage from another accident. One died at the scene. The other passed away at the hospital. Federal investigators say Villansenor had been deported on eight occasions prior to the crash. One person is killed in a crash involving a dump truck near Fisherville in southeastern Jefferson County. Police say the truck driver swerved to avoid hitting a car, trying to turn from Taylorsville Road onto South Popelick Road. The dump truck went into the westbound lane after hitting a pickup truck, killing its driver. The Fisherville Neighborhood Association has lobbied for traffic signal at the intersection. Basically, the response we've had is that there's not enough money um, to put a stoplight here um, and the um, it's just not high enough on the state's priority list. The coroner's office has not released the name of the victim. Police are investigating a smash and grab burglary at a business in southwest Louisville. Authorities say thieves used a vehicle to break through the back wall of City Gear on Cane Run Road just before 7 o'clock this morning. We're told the suspect swiped merchandise, likely several pairs of Air Jordan shoes. Yeah, the Jordans are, you know, they're something that so, Christmas time people are demanding them. But they knew what they were doing because there's all these other buildings, that's the only one they hit. Specs, if you saw or heard something, you're urged to call the anonymous tip line. Two Shepherdsville men are wanted tonight for a series of thefts from a Bullitt County storage unit facility. Pioneer Village Police identified David Simmons and John Sparks Jr. as persons of interest. Investigators say between November 18th and the 20th, someone used the same passcode to enter We Storts facility. Some of the stolen items included a DeSoto race car that has since been recovered. Others included a Yamaha dirt bike, a Harley Davidson, and a lacrosse RV trailer. They're still missing. 
If you have any information, you should call Pioneer Village Police or the Sheriff's Office. It happened across the country, including the Louisville area. Active shooter incidents in school.